And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came out of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and besought him, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, and that so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I shall be made well. And immediately the hemorrhage ceased, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone forth from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing that she had been what had been done to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But ignoring what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, he saw a tumult and people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a tumult and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha, Kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and walked. She was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sherry. Sherry was our substitute of our substitute. So Dawson had switched with Tim, and that was all worked out. And then Dawson got sick, and so we, we uh, recruited our backup of a backup for today. So uh, would you join me in a moment of prayer today? <coughs> Most gracious and holy God, open our hearts, open our minds, open our total beings that we can truly hear and receive the word that you have for us this day. Amen. I don't know if I can turn this up loud, enough, but we'll see. Um, so you all just might have to strain to hear it today. That's all. So today we're um, looking at another series of miracles of Jesus. We get to see two of them that are kind of put together, um, and both of them were sort of an interruption, if it were, to, so to speak. And so that's why I've entitled this sermon, Faith Interrupted, because we always see Jesus as having a purpose. You notice that when he goes out and is planning to go somewhere, he was, you know, he was determined to get there. And so he was never hurried, but he always had a purpose in him. He was never dawdling or anything like that. And so he has a purpose. He's going on a, on a mission, so to speak. But however, wherever he went, at this point, Jesus was surrounded by the crowds. His fame had grown. Clearly, there were folks there that just wanted to see a miracle. There were others who were truly um, suffering, and so they needed healing. And then there were those who uh, were taking in this message of love that Jesus was presenting. And so the crowds just grew, and everywhere Jesus went, there were these crowds. And this is no exception. What's interesting about this story are the people who are um, coming to Jesus in desperation. I don't know if you've ever been there. I don't know if you've ever felt that desperate need for help, um, but I've seen it in the face of others, and uh, you probably have too if you've not felt it for yourself. 
There are times when we get to this point where we are desperate. We will do anything to help our loved one or to, or to um, change a situation. And so in the case of Jairus, the synagogue leader, this is an interesting character that approaches Jesus because who are the ones that Jesus criticized the most? Who were the ones that gave Jesus the biggest hard time ever? It was the synagogue leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those who were the leaders of the religious groups. Those were the ones that were giving Jesus the, heart, the hardest time. Jairus is one of those leaders. And he comes to Jesus and falls before him. He's a desperate father at that moment. He's a desperate father at that moment. I have seen the face of desperation. Um, I remember when I was in seminary, one of our uh, requirements was to go on what's known as an immersion experience. And so I went to Santa Fe in January. I don't know if you've ever been to Santa Fe in January, but it's darn cold. It's, it was uh, single digits. And one of the ministries that we did there uh, was we went to a, a park with this woman who went there every day to feed the people who would gather in this park. Now I'm getting ready to touch on a controversial issue, I know it, so I'm warning you ahead of time. These folks were undocumented workers, and they would gather in this park to hopefully see a day wage, a day, uh, work for a day in order to help support themselves and their families. Many of them crossed the desert in order to get into Santa Fe, and many died on the way. They were desperate. You could see the desperation in their eyes and in their stories that they shared. It was more than 40 men that would gather every, every day, hoping for uh, beyond hope for just a chance to work for the day. Uh, on occasion, one or two of the cars would pull up. They would hire maybe one or two folks. But the stories went on. Many of these folks were cheated out of their, their wages. So they would agree to work for a day, but then would never get paid. And so they were desperate. They were desperate. And so this woman took it upon herself to simply feed these folks. And so she came every day with breakfast. And she worked with different churches and groups and got donations and brought some kind of a breakfast, some kind of a hot something for them to help sustain them through the day. These folks were desperate. I, I feel that Jairus was desperate. He was someone who was pleading for his daughter's life. I have never lost a child. I can't imagine what that is like. And I know some here have. You've lost a child. And it's, it's not the norm. We shouldn't be burying our children. Um, and yet, some have to do this, don't we? And so we have Jairus who's desperate for healing for his daughter. And he comes to the one whom the fame had spread and the word was out that he was the one who could heal. And so he... He approaches Jesus, and Jesus agrees to go with him. Can you just, maybe for a second, feel Jairus' sigh of relief as soon as Jesus starts to walk off with him? Can you just feel that maybe there's this little bit of his burden that's lifted? Maybe just a, a, a bit of hope that he's able to cling to as Jesus starts to walk with him. But this story's not over. There's another interruption that comes along the way. There's another woman in that crowd who's desperate. She had been through multiple doctors. She was hemorrhaging, and no one could stop it. She was wasting away. She was a wealthy woman. She spent all the money she had on all the doctors that were out there, and to no avail. She was no better. In fact, she was getting worse. She was desperate. She was desperate. And her faith was so strong that she truly believed that if all she had to do was to touch Jesus' garment somehow, just touch his cloak, and he, she knew she, in her heart that she would be healed. And I don't know of any other story where Jesus, someone actually touched Jesus' cloak and were healed. I'm not familiar with another one. There may be others in there. I'm just not, they're not coming to mind. So I don't know where she would get that understanding that if all she had to do was to touch his cloak. But her faith was that strong. And sure enough, she manages to wade her way through this horrendous crowd that is surrounding Jesus as he's walking with Jairus to Jairus' home. And she managed to touch his garment. And immediately she felt the healing in her body. She felt it immediately. The, the hemorrhaging ceased immediately. And she's not the only one who knew that something happened. Jesus knew it as well. Jesus felt the power leaving him. 
and knew it as well. And so he asks this ridiculous question. Who touched my clothes? Now, if you can pick your picture, um, anybody ever remember general admission concerts? <laughs> Did you ever go to a general admission? Or uh, better yet, when Southwest first started out, yeah. you know, and you were herded like cattle because you had one of the first 20 boarding passes, and so you were all cramming together. Picture that scene as Jesus is looking around saying, who touched my clothes? Who wasn't touching his clothes at that point? I mean, everybody was touching his clothes, right? I mean, you can't help it. You were elbow to elbow. You know, they have stopped, I think, general admission concerts because people were trampled. Because at, with a general admission ticket, you had a ticket to get in, but you didn't have a seat. You didn't have an assigned seat. And so you were rushing to get to the best seats possible. People would die trying to see the Rolling Stones or somebody else at a general admission concert. And so I think they've stopped that process. I really hope they do. I was amazed the last time I went to the movies out at the, out at the mall that we had assigned seats in the movies, which is kind of nice. You know, they have recliners and everything. It's awesome. Um, but I, I just had no idea. And so uh, just picture that pressing crowd all around Jesus. And he's asking this ridiculous question. Who touched my clothes? He knew something had happened. And so this woman knows exactly what happened to her. And so she falls before Jesus, and it tells her exactly what she did and, and what, was, what was going on. And Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. And so she, he's ready to send her on his way. But can you put yourself in Jairus' position at this moment? Jesus is interrupted on the way to healing his daughter. Jesus is delayed, and his daughter is, is, is fighting for every breath. Can you imagine Jairus' feeling? of frustration and, and urgency. Come on, we need to go, right? I can just imagine how frustrated Jesus, uh, Jairus was with Jesus at this time. And if that's not enough, while all this is going on, Jairus receives word that his daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? I also have to put myself in this woman's place. How would we feel knowing that we cost the life of a young girl while we sought healing from Jesus. I, I wonder how she must have felt in that moment. But I think all fears were assuaged as soon as Jesus said, don't have any fear. To only believe, only believe. I'm not sure at this point, a lot of times the miracles that Jesus has done are in different orders in, in the Gospels and things. So it's not clear whether or not Jesus had ever risen anyone from the dead prior to this. But he's, he's, I can just see the face of Jesus looking at this desperate, distraught father saying, only believe, only believe. And so they start off again, only this time, Jesus calls only the big three. You always know there's something big going to happen when Jesus calls together the big three. Peter, James, and John. And it's a clue in Scripture. As soon as Jesus says, all right, y'all stay here. I'm going to bring Peter, James, and John with me. You know something big is going to happen. And there's no exception here. And so it's just Peter, James, and John, and Jairus that walk off with Jesus. And this crowd is left behind. They approach the house. And what do they find but these professional whalers? Now, there's a job for you. That was their profession, was to act out a person's grief in song and in tale as, as something has happened. So clearly, they were called ahead of time that this girl was on her uh, on death's door. And so she was on her last breath, so to speak. And as soon as she dies, they begin. And they begin to, to, to just, you know, wail and, and just sing out these horrible, you know, sorrowful songs to, to play out this family's grief in song. But you get a funny feeling it's not really sincere. Because at some point when Jesus says, what are you doing here? She's not dead, she's just asleep. They managed to laugh at her. They managed to laugh at her. So clearly it's not necessarily a sincere um, feeling of grief for this family. It's just a profession. And uh, you've got these wailers that then are silenced by the Almighty God in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus says the, the, only the parents in with the girl. He barely speaks her name, grabs her hand. And she rises up and rises from the dead. And so we have this double miracle here, but both of them were interruptions. I wonder how we handle interruptions. 
Do we handle them with grace? Do we, do we see them as, I mean, I don't know about you all, but I usually have, I'm, I'm a scheduled person. I like to write my lists. My husband hates it, but you know, I got a project list right now because we're getting ready to move. And so I've got this long, um, how do you do this? I guess is what you call them, you know? Um, and so I, I like my lists. I like to, you know, I like to go, okay, step one, step two, step three, let's just keep going down. But life isn't like that, is it? Life has this tendency to interrupt us, doesn't it? So how do we gracefully handle those interruptions? How do we gracefully handle those interruptions? You don't. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> At times, I think we just remind ourselves of that mantra that I've asked you to, to, to hold on to throughout this season of Lent. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And as we take that, particularly that second piece, love your neighbor as yourself. During these times of interruption, is there a way to love our neighbor as ourselves? In, in spite of the fact that we had an agenda and we're having to deer, steer off a little bit. And then as we end half that day, and, and with the same mantra, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, sort of evaluate, how do we do that today? Were we so distracted by our agenda that we ignored the needs around us? I, my prayer is that we will all befriend someone else this week, just like we were talking with the kids. Um, I think it has a lot to do with um, some of the issues that we're seeing and that we're becoming more and more isolated as, as people, and yet I do believe we need each other. Now, I am purposefully isolating myself from you today uh, because there are certain things you just don't want to share. Um, this is just one of them. So I am not feeling well today. I'm sorry. My husband's been sick all week, too. So we, we just don't want to share that. But as we gather as this body of Christ, and as we continue to lift one another up in, in our sorrowful times, in our joyful times, we are the body of Christ, but we can share that love with others so that they will know we are Christians by our love. God with us. Amen.